Okay, good morning everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening. Welcome to the week four session of writing Wikipedia articles. Uh, this is an exciting session for me because we get to hear from some interesting experts. We have two guests with us today. Uh, one is Priscilla Gonzalez, who is the Ashoka Fellow um, and a, an education researcher in Brazil who has uh, done a lot of work in open educational resources. And our other guest is Adrienne Wadowitz, who is a longtime Wikipedian and will share with us some of her work um, in writing and improving Wikipedia articles. So I'm going to give them a more thorough introduction in a moment, uh, but I will first just ask if there are any pressing questions about the homework. Uh, last week we introduced the final project for the course, and I have seen many of you uh, working hard on Wikipedia. Uh, of course, our lab session is the, the time to really dig into uh, detailed questions, but if there's anything that is holding you up or if you have any, um, any major questions that you'd like to ask that we can cover now, please speak up now. And if not, we can move right into hearing our guests' presentations. So I'm going to just watch the chat window for a moment. OK, well, I'm not seeing any questions. So please do, if you have questions, either put them on our class talk page or attend the Thursday lab session, and we'll, uh, we'll have a good time looking at the articles that you're working on, I'm sure. Uh, I've been enjoying watching that develop, and I'm sure your classmates will be interested to see what you're working on as well. So let's get to our first guest. And I will repeat, she has requested that we speak slowly today. I'm trying to do my best to speak slowly. Uh, please let me know if I'm not being clear. Uh, she's not a native English speaker, but um, the, she's, uh, her native language is Portuguese, and she does speak very good English, so even though she says she doesn't. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so Priscilla Gonzalez is the Ashoka Fellow in 2013. Uh, she has a master's degree in education, family, and technology from Salamanca University in Spain. And she's been working with education and technology for more than 10 years, uh, creating and coordinating projects in Brazil. Uh, she has been with CENPEC, uh, which is the Center for Education, Culture, and Community Action Studies. And she is a director and the co-founder of the Educa Digital Institute, which focuses on developing and managing projects that aim to integrate digital culture into education. So Priscilla, I hope you can help us uh, see what some of the Wikipedia articles relating to open education look like to an OER expert. And if you'd like me to open any web pages and put them on the screen while you're talking, please just tell me or put the link in the chat window. Hi, hi, Pete. Are you hearing me? Yes, loud and clear. Ah. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I don't know if I, I start to speaking something about my job or someone has questions for me. What do you think? Uh, I, I think if you can give us a bit of an introduction so that people uh, know what kind of questions to ask, that would be helpful. Um, and also, if you have anything that you would like me to pull up in the web browser so that we can all look at it, uh, please let me know that as well. OK. I, I was reading about the article, the OER article, yesterday night. And I noticed um, it would be interesting to have some information about initiatives in Brazil. Um, Nowadays, we have a lot of initiatives besides the public policy. Public policy, we have initiatives from institutions that are putting their materials, their content in a, using a 
Creative Commons license. And maybe, hi, I don't know if it's working. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, so my, my screen is strange now. But, okay. ah, a video, maybe? No. Ah. Yeah, this article I was reading yesterday. And it has some initiatives, OER Commons, OER UNESCO, OER Africa. And maybe if you could plan a, a part in the, in the Wikipedia in the, uh, to re write articles, uh, that explains some initiatives about OER. I think it would be interesting. And I can send you a lot of initiatives in Brazil. Um, what do you think about that? Yes, yes, please. I think we'd be very interested to hear about them. Uh, for example, I put the Did you see this? Yes, this is, it's for loading. Forvir is an initiative that was launched last year in 2012. And there, there is an English version. Put the English version, please. For you, it's better. OK, uh, I'm looking for the link. Uh, Oh, I see. I see. Uh, uh, yeah. English version. Yeah. Uh, this project is about um, education and innovation. They use a Creative Commons CC BY and uh, let me see the page in English. I'm sorry. It seems to be loading very slowly. There we go. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All of these articles and interviews about uh, initiatives in Brazil or around the world that are innovating in education. And, and the best, the most important initiative nowadays in Brazil related uh, in journalism, related with journalism that uh, brings to, to people this information, innovation and technology. Uh, in my institution, Educa Digital Institute, Institute, is doing a new project with them uh, with digital tools of learning. We will launch it next week in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, it will be the first time we will have uh, tools, learning tools, classified by use, uh, like use, uh, how to use. If you can choose tools, copyright tools or CC, CC tools, you. It uh, looks like the advanced search in Google when you can choose what kind of uses uh, your, what, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to. It's okay. Is there another link you'd like me to, to show on the screen? Yeah. If you see the end of the page in Purview, I think it, there is the information about Creative Commons license. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. There is another initiative. Uh, or, but this one, uh, we don't have the English version. Okay. It's about Oh. No, maybe yes. without or the air. Okay. Mm. Mm. 
Thank you. Let me get to this platform. Try it. Okay. 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 Yeah. It is an interesting we are. Uh, we help them to create this uh, to help to to use a license from this 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 platform, this content. It's an Indian community that are posting their history, their culture, their uh, mythology to explain by themselves about themselves. In the end of the page, if you put the end of the, the home page, that is the license too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these are these are resources for students what age? But how, how old would the students be? Uh, not exactly a specific age. Okay. Other other one who is interesting to to know more about Indian culture, Indian history, they can look for in this website. Okay. Okay. What else? Um, and I think, um, Priscilla, we actually have not talked in this class very much about licenses. Um, so maybe we can, uh, maybe maybe I can uh, do a, a brief overview of what you mean by uh, Creative Commons licenses. I think some of our students are probably familiar with them from their past work, but we haven't covered this specifically. So Creative Commons, of course, is an organization that maintains free licenses. Oh, oh I see. I'm in the Portuguese version. So, mm -hmm. um, so. These these licenses are. It's basically a way for someone to very clearly uh, express that they want their work to be shared freely and for other people to build upon it. Um, okay. So this is sort of the the uh, opposite of the way that copyright is often. Uh, used in publishing, where the main idea is to protect the rights of the author or the the person who created the work. Uh, this is really the it's the foundation of Wikipedia and of open educational resources. Um, it's a it's a very important uh, kind of legal document that that makes it makes it clear that the people who are working on these things together want you to reuse their work. So. Um, and there are different variants of the licenses, but I think one of the more common ones is this basic one that we're looking at, which is called the attribution license, which essentially says all you need to do is give attribution to the original author if you want to reuse. Um, so this could be used for photographs, for the text on Wikipedia, for a textbook, uh, any kind of creative work. Uh, and I think one one more point, I guess, when it, when you signed up for your Wikipedia account to, to all of our students, uh, you may not have noticed, but you have agreed to use uh, not exactly this license, but a similar one, uh, which is the attribution share alike license. That's part of the terms of use of Wikipedia, so that when you yeah. write an article, you make it clear that other people can edit your work mm -hmm. and and continue to work on it. Mm -hmm. There's another website is about our project in Brazil, but it's, I don't, it's only in Portuguese. Okay. We put information about oh yeah we have a, a frequent asked question about what is what is oh yeah what the public policy in Brazil. Uh, projects around the world in open education, a lot of conceptions um, that is important for our work and for society to know more about OER. 
Okay, so I would think that a site like this would probably be very useful for finding reference material to to work on the Wikipedia article. Um, and this is something that we run into very frequently when we're working on topics uh, that are international, is that you might have a site in a different language. So, of course, Google Translate can be a very useful tool. Yeah. yeah. Um, if I if I were wanting to understand this site better, to use it as a source, yeah. I would. That's good. And they can uh, send me an email in English. My written English is better than my oral English, and I can. Uh, Reply with some information about uh, about public policy or something, some reference, okay. or just explain um, how is how is our working here with OER depends on the the kind of search they are doing. Okay. So, ah, okay. Priscilla, would, uh -huh. uh, would you like to? Uh, I'm, I'm thinking if you could share your uh, contact information and maybe your Twitter name uh, in the chat window. That might be helpful to students that have any follow-up questions. And then maybe we can take the next few minutes to take any questions before. I know you have to okay. leave uh, at 30 minutes past the hour. So. Okay, I have more. Uh, Ten. Ten minutes. Okay. So, do we have any questions for Priscilla about open educational resources in Brazil? I think we just saw a lot of uh, more detailed uh, information than we've seen about uh, some specific topics than we usually do in class. So, uh, it might take people a moment to come up with their questions. Uh, okay. Okay, so uh, Sarah is wondering if you could go into a little more detail about uh, what you think on this, uh, the OER article on Wikipedia. Yeah, um, I, was so we, talking, I was talking in the first uh, uh, first part of the, our talking. I would like to see information about initiatives, about projects uh, that are uh, you that are being creating uh, as OER. Let me see one more thing about the OER. So, um, the the OER policy section uh, that we're looking at now, there's there's of course a, a separate article on open educational resources policy, which is something that Sarah and uh, some of our students and other members of our project have worked on recently. Um, and so this has a little bit more detail about specific OER policies and projects. So and and Sarah is saying in the chat window, I think it's. Uh, it's important to to think about when when adding a project or a policy to the Wikipedia article. It's important to consider how widely mm -hmm. notable it is. So, is it something that has been covered in um, in international publications uh, or news articles or something like the Chronicle of Higher Education? Um, you know, things like that should certainly be added to an article like this. But sometimes, uh, if a project is very small and local, it might not be as appropriate to the Wikipedia article. So making these, th this is one of the things that our students would really need to think about um, in working with the material that you've shown us, is how, um, you know, which of the projects that you've shown us are the more notable ones, and can, which ones can we find independent references for. Uh, so, Therese, you were discussing this concept just before class, it sounds like. Uh, I see one of our – oh, go ahead. Uh, 
Yeah, if I could just jump in here. Um, I was just, I was discussing with Sarah G um, whether, um, say, an OER initiative from a university is notable enough to warrant its own article. You know, so what's notable? Now, you just said that it kind of goes by the literature citing it. Um, right. is, is that, so if, if that's it, then yeah, then that, that, I guess that answers my question. Yeah, and, and there, are, there is more detail we can get into. And yeah, Sarah has exactly the same idea that it might be good to, uh, to bring in Adrienne into the discussion here. Um, let, me, let me just uh, give you a brief uh, introduction to Adrienne. And I know she has a, diff a specific article she wants to show us. But um, uh, maybe we can uh, just start off with an answer to this question. Uh, so Adrienne Wadowitz is a Mellon, a Mellon Digital Scholarship Fellow at Occidental College. And she and a, a PhD. Uh, she has a PhD from Indiana University in English literature, and she's been a Wikipedian for over ten years, and is one of the top fifteen producers of high quality content on the site. So we're really we have a very experienced Wikipedian uh, here to talk with us today. She's also done a great deal with education with Wikipedia. Uh, I first got to know Adrienne through our work. Uh, in developing an education program that supports uh, professors in assigning Wikipedia work to their students. Uh, and she's been very active with that program as well. So Adrienne, maybe you can address this notability question while we still have Priscilla with us and, uh, and then go on to your presentation. Sure. Um, it seems to me that for something to be notable, you have to have reports of it outside the institution where it happens. So if there's a program that's running inside your university, but the only reports of it are, you know, like publications with inside, with, within the university, that's not notable enough. It has yeah. to be other people within the field talking about it um, outside your own institution. Does that make sense? I think so, yeah. Um, and this, so this is something that I, I think, again, with, the, um, with working across languages can be a bit of a challenge to assess. Um, because if something like the, the programs that Priscilla has been talking about have been covered in, uh, for, for example, in Brazilian articles, it might be a little more difficult for us to search and find good independent sources. Um, but that is the kind of thing that we want to look for. And, and I also, I did put together a short video on finding sources to expand an article uh, last week, which I'm going to find a, a link to remind you all if you want to review how you can go and, um, you know, basically how to search for reference material on the web. Uh, I see we're, we're getting very close to half past the hour, so I think Priscilla is going to have to leave us. Do we have any last questions for Priscilla before we move on to Adrienne's presentation? Oh, yes, Priscilla, um, do you have a, a link to your, do you have any contact information you can share with us or a link to an online profile so that if our students want to contact you after the class? Sorry, uh, Can you share your email address? Ah, uh, my email. Or, or any website that will help people find you? OK. Very good. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Priscilla. It's fascinating to hear from someone with your thank expertise. You. So Adrienne, would you like to move into your presentation? Sure. Are you going to do the links to the page, or am I? Yes, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Um, okay, cool. Um, so so just tell me which one you 
One, Wait, two, three. Start with the uh, uh, old one, the one at the top. Okay, very good. Um, so Pete asked me to talk about how I developed an article, sort of like the history of I got to an article, I had to research it, I had to write it, um, and sort of the process that I went through with that. Um, so anytime I'm talking about something that doesn't make sense or I use a word or a phrase that's strange, please just type a question um, into the chat there um, and I'll address it. Um, that question about news articles, yeah, I'm going to get to that, okay? Um, all right, so I decided to write a biography about an American rock climber. And it doesn't really matter what you're writing about. All of the questions that I'm going to talk about, have to you have to answer them um, in the articles that you're writing. So when I got to this article, um, this is what it looked like back in November of 2012. It was just about four paragraphs long. Um, if you scroll to the end, this was about all there was. Um, and there's a lot more. There, were, there was a handful of references, as you can see, about five, and a couple of external links, and that was it. Um, this woman is one of the most famous rock climbers, so there's a lot more to be said about her. Um, and if you can open the current page, you can see what it looks like now. So the question is, how did you, I go from those four paragraphs to this whole article? that has sections, that has um, a lot more, that has little images, that has little quotes, that as you can tell has a lot more um, references, and it has a whole narrative that you can follow through, and has, um, it has a list of various things she's climbed, right? So there's this whole um, structure to the article. So how did I do that? Um, first off, I had to find sources um, to write the article because everything you put into Wikipedia, I'm sure as you know, um, Pete has drilled this into your head now, everything you put into Wikipedia has to have a source that goes with it. Um, so what can you use as a source? Somebody was already asking, can you use a news article as a source? You absolutely can use a news article as long as it's from a reputable news outlet, um, not like a tabloid. Right? It has to be something that's been fact-checked, like the New York Times or the LA Times. or And it can be um, news sources from around the world, because there are great newspapers, like in London and in Germany. And if you can read those in those languages, that's awesome. Um, so it, the, the best kind of source is something that's peer-reviewed scholarship. So something that um, scholars have published and other scholars have looked at. That's sort of the gold standard. And then you sort of go down the ladder um, into news um, and magazines and things like that. Um, and then, yeah, that's the uh, policy right there on reliable sources. Um, so we always are using what are called secondary sources, um, sources that have been um, vetted by other people. Uh, and you want to ideally stay away from what are called primary sources. And this gets a little bit dicey sometimes, um, and that's why actually I chose this article to talk about. Um, so, for example, you wouldn't want to use um, a first-hand account uh, of somebody or uh, an opinion piece, for example, because um, none of those are fact-checked sources. We'll talk about what to do if that's all you have. Okay. Is, it, yeah, is there a, an easy example of something that would not be a great source, something um, I can pull up? Yeah, um, I would say, um, well, anybody's personal blog. <laughs> you know, I'm like thinking something related to this article, but if there's not an obvious example, we can move on. Oh well, I mean, yeah, I, yeah, there is. Yeah, um, if you go back to the article, because um, I even used it because there was, it, it's questionable. I used it because it was questionable to see if anybody would. Um, uh, catch it. I'm actually writing a, a scholarly piece on this to demonstrate the problems with sources on Wikipedia, so I think it's still there because no one's removed it. Okay. Um, so I guess we can interfere with your with your scholarship here by... With my, with my, <laughs> my experiment, yeah, exactly. 
see whether anyone's let's see. Oh yeah, it's source ninety nine. Okay, so this is someone's self-published blog, um, this woman here, Christine, and so basically you don't want to use a blog unless the person who publishes the blog is an expert in the field. So for example, um, in the New York Times they have various blogs and there was a, a political blog um, by Nate Silver during the election, and he's an expert in elections, right? Um, and so that's okay. You can use his blog because that's fine, even though it's not blogs are never fact checked. Even if they're in the New York Times website, they're not fact checked. Um, a lot of people don't understand that distinction. But because Nate Silver himself um, is an expert um, in elections and mathematics, it would be totally fine to use his statistical analysis of the election. This person, not an expert. She's just really interested in rock climbing. The flip side of that is this is an interview. So maybe you could say it's justified. Maybe. But this is an extremely, um, this is an extremely sort of iffy use of a source right here. Um, is that I took an interview from somebody who nobody knows if they're really that reliable of an interviewer. I don't really know anything about this person, right? Um, so Adrian, would it, could, could it depend on what it is that you're sourcing to this article? Well, I mean, that would, if I had to argue, right, against the Wikipedia, that's what I would say, right, is that, hey, this is an interview, it's actually Lynn Hill's, you know, like, actual words, you know, it's not an interpretation of them, um, and it's her personal stuff, and so that's what I would say. But it's, um, is it controversial? You know, so that's another thing you can always um, talk about if it's just sort of non-controversial details of her life. That's okay. But again, it's, you know, it's sort of, it's up to each Wikipedian. And actually that's sort of a, a thing to, to emphasize is that even though it seems like there are really strict rules about it, those rules get interpreted differently. Um, and different people interpret them different ways, sort of depending on where, what information they want to include. Um, so, obviously you want to try to use the best sources you possibly can. Um, and depending on, uh, oh, Glenn, I did not see that article. I would love to see that um, about what Chelsea Clinton wrote about women editors. Um, so, but if you run into problems with finding sources, um, it's a really good idea to try to think about, well, what kinds of information am I drawing from this and what kind, you know, what kind of argument can I make that, you know, the sources that I have found um, are acceptable at an acceptable level. Um, so you have to sort of think about what kind of information am I drawing, who's writing it, what's the audience of it, sort of all that goes into decisions about sources. Um, so where are you going to find sources? That's a good thing to think about. Um, people go to Google immediately, um, and you'll find a lot of news sources and these kinds of websites through Google. Um, people go to Google Scholar. That's very helpful for finding peer-reviewed sources. Um, I don't know how many of you have access to university libraries, um, but that's the best for finding the most reliable sources because you'll have access to large databases um, of, of articles through things like JSTOR and EBSCO. Um, yeah, Mendeley is very great in, in areas as well, so. Um, the other thing is, as you're doing research, the articles um, and books you're looking at will themselves refer you to other articles um, and books. And that's the best way to sort of create this chain of sources. Um, and it's another way to justify some maybe less than ideal sources is you can say, hey, this particular interview um, is cited quite a bit in actual peer-reviewed research that I'm looking at. Um, okay, so other questions about sources. Have people done a lot of research? Are you familiar with how to do research? Because it's actually a very difficult skill. 
Um, and it takes a long time to really learn how to do well. Before I go on about that. Yeah, please feel free to enter any questions in the chat window, or if your microphone is working, just speak up. Adrian, I think just from our past experience, it's uh, it, people often take a little while to formulate their questions. So maybe um, okay, we can if if people have questions about sources, feel free to ask them a little later, and we'll just we'll come back for questions in a few minutes. Sure. Um, okay, so if you can go to that third link down on the page um, of notes I sent you. Um, so after I had read around a bit and I got a sense of what information was available um, on, oh, let me just answer this question about the source here. Um, yeah, generally the idea is if the source is a commentary, that's the best thing because it's then you're providing a published commentary, which you're then summarizing and putting on Wikipedia, because you're not putting your own ideas on Wikipedia, right? You're putting someone else's ideas on Wikipedia. That's what you want to do, exactly what you want to do. Um, okay, so once I sort of collected my initial group of sources, um, and there was just a handful, really, initially that I started with. It was like five or seven. Um, I read through them and I got a sense of what the major kinds of information were that I was going to have um, and I started to structure the article. Um, and if you can just look at the table of contents here, um, you can see what I started with. So I decided there was going to be, you can just leave that table of contents up, Steve. Um, and so I started with section on early years and then there was going to be a big section on this woman's climbing career because that's what she's known for. And then she climbed this really famous um, thing in Yosemite Valley called The Nose, sort of a really funny name. Um, and because she was one of the earliest famous female climbers, um, I decided to make a section on gender politics. And actually, I want to emphasize this because this really um, matters. This starts to matter who edits the article, right? If somebody else had written this article, they might not have written this section in this way. So even though Wikipedia has a neutral point of view policy um, and you are summarizing what other people have written. The way you structure the page is actually, uh, it's your choice, right? And you can emphasize certain things and de-emphasize certain things. So I emphasize this part about gender politics. I mean, I'm a feminist. There's going to be no way that that's not going to happen, right? Um, and so. There is a way in which there's no way to be completely neutral and completely objective when you're editing. But what you want to do is be aware of the choices that you're making about it. Um, that's the part that's really significant. And know that you can say, yeah, there's a lot in all of the articles that I've read about her being a woman and her being the first woman to do something or the only woman to do something. Um, and that means that there's a gender issue surrounding her as a climber. Um, and then I had two other sections, one on her uh, media presences and one on her personal life. Uh, because her personal life was pretty de-emphasized um, in a lot of the, the reports. Um, so one of the issues I really had to deal with was that there were lots and lots of interviews um, and those were really the sources I had um, to go on. There aren't a lot of, there isn't a lot of published scholarship on climbing. So I had to figure out how to present first person interviews as third person summary writing. Um, in an encyclopedia. And so the writing of it actually became kind of difficult um, when I was summarizing it. And so um, if you look at the history, you'll notice that there's over a thousand edits um, of me just adding it a sentence here and a sentence there. Um, and so I didn't put my article um, like on a Word document or in a sandbox and then perfect it slowly over the course of months. I just threw in sentences as I found information um, from lots of different sources. Because I, one, I always wanted the information to be as up to date as possible um, when people came to the article because it was so abysmal when I started. Um, and second of all, I wanted the chance um, for anybody else to help me with these problems. Because these are big problems of trying to summarize interviews, um, or come up with a new structure. Um, and that's yeah. 
Is there a, uh, a certain like Months that I can jump to in the history screen to when you were especially active in developing the article. Uh, to give a November, sense of that. Uh -huh. uh. We've looked at history screens rather extensively in this class, so I think that people have have an understanding how to uh, how to interpret what they're looking at. 2012, not 2010. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I think you still have 2010. Oh, you're. You're saying it, 2012 is the correct date? I don't yeah, know how 2010 came up. Um, yeah, that's, that's weird. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Oh, no, this is, so this, I did put 2012, but then it looks like it's. Yeah, if you just click on the, on the thing on the bottom where it says like the last 500 edits, mm -hmm. okay. you know, that works. Yeah. Well, I think I just went to December, and it looks like that's maybe it was more December than November, and that was a. So you can see, like I'm like fixing ref, adding bits, adding more material, renaming, right? Like, um, it's just uh, tons and tons of little tiny things are happening, or adding little tiny bit there, right? Like that's a good example, adding bit. <laughs> like I don't even really describe what bit it is I'm adding, um, but yeah. It's just like a little sentence, right? That year she performed a series of impressive feats leading this um, particular route with one fall. And, and then I quote from a source, perhaps the most difficult first ascent at the time, right? And then I add in the source and that's all. Um, and that gets um, revised later. Like everything gets revised and revised and revised. Um, but at least that information is there and I don't have to worry about losing the source or what information goes with it. Um, that sort of thing. I, I think this is a. I think this is really an interesting point. That um, I, I'm just. I'm guessing that this might be something that's especially interesting to our students because, you know, what you're what you're doing here in in bringing this towards a featured article and really one of the best thousand or so uh, or four thousand or so articles on Wikipedia. Um, is is a really is is a, a pretty huge feat compared to the the level that we've been editing at. But it seems like this point is something that that shows the continuum, right? Yeah. Because this these these kinds of small edits you could make whether your goal was to make it into a featured article or whether you were just trying to capture something that you saw in the news and thought was important to have in the article without ever intending to come back. It's the yeah, same kind of behavior either that. way. Right. Yeah, sometimes I just do one sentence like that when I read something in a book and I'm like, oh, that's missing from a Wikipedia article. And I just add one sentence and one ref like that and that's it. Um, I, see, I see we have a, a question in the chat window too from Jade. Uh, were you able to use the subjective word impressive because of the direct quote? So yes. is that, yeah, exactly. So where, otherwise it would be my opinion that it's impressive. Exactly. Um, but because we have a quote on that, I can totally do that. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize about the working on this article, um, if you go to the top page, um, immediately when I first started working on it, um, I went to the talk page and I said, hey, any Wikipedians around um, that want to help out, I'm working on this. And while I was working on it continuously, I was talking to other people, um, basically to other editors about it. So I started by saying, I'm going to revise this article. Anyone want to help me? Um, and then, you know, someone responded a couple of days later, was like, I've got some books, here's some information. And you'll notice there's this ongoing discussion about various issues that come up down the talk page. Um, so if you could slowly scroll down, yeah. So then there's us talking about sources, there's us talking about trying to get a photo. It was impossible to get a good photo for this article because none of them were licensed CC by SA. I even managed to get this climber's phone number and like text her and try to get a photo, but that didn't work out. Um, but like we go through all of these issues. Um, we talk about how to describe um, 
her body in the info box, which is really interesting. Like, should we include her height and weight? Um, was, you know, that's a really interesting discussion, actually. Um, you know, a lot of athletes who describe their height and weight, how important is that? You know, it really varies continuously. Um, so we had a small discussion about that. Um, and then at a certain point in the article, I asked another Wikipedian to come and review it. Um, there's a GA review there, a good article review. Um, and another uh, Wikipedian gave a lot of help of like how we can improve the language, how we can improve the structure. And that helps a lot because you sort of get into um, uh, a mindset where you're like, okay, I can sort of see everything I want to convey, um, but other people come and see things in a different way. And they sort of say, hey, I don't understand this, you know, how can you improve it? And you guys are probably going to do reviews of each other's, right, if other Wikipedians don't come by? Yes? No? Yes, we do encourage that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and this is, you should definitely give yourselves enough time to go back and revise. Um, because if you're not revising as you're going, you have to revise when people um, point out, oh, wow, I really don't quite um, understand. Um, so one of the big problems with writing about rock climbing, for example, is that nobody in, in the general public even understands uh, what rock climbing is. So, like, if you write about a basketball, art, uh, basketball player, people understand the general basketball playing, you know, sort of thing. They understand what a basketball game is. Um, but if I'm referring to different kinds of rock climbing, people don't really get that. So there has to be a way in which you can sort of integrate that into the article. So having people come by and say, hey, this is still too specific. There's still too much jargon. Here's where I don't understand what's happening was really helpful. And in the case of OER articles, that's going to be a big deal. Um, because you're going to have to make it so that people really understand a lot of that educational jargon that we're used to reading about, um, but other people in the general public are not. So that's a, that's a big deal. Um, okay, so questions about developing an article, about getting sources, about writing, about revising about just putting your stuff on Wikipedia. I'm a big fan of just putting it on and seeing what happens. It can be a little scary. Yeah, um, so I think Therese has been uh, moving towards putting together a list of, uh, of open educational resources projects at different universities. Uh, would you like, should I pull that up on the screen, Therese? Do you want to maybe take that as a, uh, we could we could discuss that a little bit? Or is there anyone else who, okay, so let's, let's start with that. Uh, I think you put that in your sandbox. I'm going to just go to our class talk page to find the link because I know you brought it up there. Okay, so this is just, you just put together a very basic beginning, uh, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you're thinking about building this into. Okay, well, I'm aware that um, <clears throat> a lot of universities worldwide have, um, I don't know, created their own repositories of OER, done, you know, individual um, OER projects, and um, I was talking with one of my group members, um, Sarah G, and we were just wondering how could we um, start to build an article that, um, you know, anyway, we, we didn't even know, like, d do you do an article about an individual university's OER initiative? Um, and hence some of the questions that we were talking about earlier today, just now. Um, well, in the last lab, I asked some of these questions, and um, Pete suggested that perhaps the individual universities OER initiatives would be better placed in a, in a list. And so, well, yesterday was a bank holiday. I was off, so I was just sitting in my uh, backyard, and I just went and copied another list. It happened to be a list of 1960s uh, top 40 hits. And that's why you see there were some weird um, entries still in my OER list, OER initiatives list. But anyway, the idea was to start um, a list of these things. Like my own university has, 
has um, an OER repository, but I don't think it's been mentioned <laughs> anywhere outside of uh, my university. I could be wrong, but it's a pretty small one. Um, now I think Sarah G has uh, her her university has a uh, has a bigger one, and perhaps it is mentioned in um, you know some external sources, some journals. I, I don't know. Perhaps it is. Um, I was thinking of Open Nottingham. Nottingham University has its own. Um, so you know, like mine and Open Nottingham, they're not quite as big as uh, you know the MIT one. So perhaps it, it is better to just uh, create a list of these. But then we, we we need to separate them by uh, country. I would have thought, and perhaps separate them by the type of initiative they are. Well, do I use the word repository? That's where I got a bit a bit confused. But um, I'm sort of thinking that these are OER repositories, and so that's where I'm at. I just just started just started it here. Okay, uh, I see uh, Sarah has uh, a, a good suggestion for you in the chat window, and then also. Um, I was pulling up this this uh, this book, A Basic Guide to Open Educational Resources, uh, is something that lists a, a whole lot of websites related to OER, and in many cases, that's going to be those are going to be OER um, repositories as well. So this might be another source that you could use um, to build out a list like that. Adrienne, do you have any comments on how you might go about building a list of this nature? Um, yeah, list articles are some of the hardest ones uh, to build because you have to establish that there there should be a list. You know what I mean? Like um, generally, you have to find a source that is a list to begin with to justify having a list. <laughs> um, that's the best way to really do it. Um, and that list doesn't have to be complete, and it doesn't have to include everything on it that that the um, Wikipedia list is going to have, but it's a good way um, to justify having a list. Because remember, Wikipedia really isn't supposed to have original lists. Um, it's not that it doesn't, um, but it really isn't supposed to. Uh, uh, so, I mean, a good example is a is a bibliography, right? There are um, a lot of bibliographies that already exist, and so Wikipedia can have them. And although some of those bibliographies that currently exist are incomplete, Wikipedia can have a better one. But the the fact is that kind of list already exists. Um, so finding a list of OER stuff like projects already existing somewhere, you can say, hey, yeah, you know, this is, you know, someone else has already said that this is a, a helpful thing. Of course, this one doesn't count because it's a wiki source list, right? Um, so you can't use no, 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 no. That's yeah. actually this is just a wiki source republication of a right. book that. Oh, there we go. Well, yeah, there you yeah. go. Okay. Almost like you can just use the book as the justification. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about the uh, the choice? Uh, I think as we were discussing this last week, uh, we were talking about starting a, a list as a completely separate article versus putting something in the open educational resources article and building it up and then maybe splitting it off. Uh, any any comments on that choice? Yeah, I mean, um, well, it really depends what your what your aim is. You know, I mean, having mentions in the article itself, I mean, obviously that leads to problems because um, whose project you know is going to get mentioned in the article? That's difficult to decide. Um, usually, though, you want to have some programs mentioned in the article to give people an idea of, well, this is what an actual program looks like. Um, so usually that gets decided by which programs get mentioned the most often in sources. Um, that's how you would decide that. Um, that's, I mean, people would go to NPOVs. Um, that would be the policy that would help you decide that. Um, but that's not always an easy thing to figure out. You know, um, what are the most you know, one of the largest, most famous programs. I mean, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. You know, right. But I think this is, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know the answer to that either. And I've been working on this for. A while. I don't think any one person just knows the answer. I think this is yeah. the sort of thing that 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 Wikipedia really exists to support. Is a is a, a discourse on this, right? It, yeah. Try putting something in the article. Put a note on the talk page. 
you know, and give establish a space to have that discussion. Um, so I think I think, yeah, I think this you, is uh, definitely don't want the article itself to become a long list of programs. That's an unhelpful kind of article. Right. Yeah. And I think that's sort of what led us towards maybe a separate uh, a separate list. But but there is there is this sort of inherent question there of how notable are are the the many different entities, and we're we're only going to get to the bottom of that by looking at independent sources the way that yeah. Adrian's been talking about. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, I see that Shepard Song had a question you answered in the chat window about uh, do you have to add a notation for every statement? This is going back towards uh, back to your article on Lynn Hill. Uh, do you want right. to just address that briefly before we? Yeah, before definitely. We um, technically, no, you don't have to. Um, you're supposed to only have to add um, a source for any statement that could be challenged or is controversial. Um, I think that's what the reliable sources policy says. But in practice, it's best to just add a source for every statement you add because ultimately any statement can be challenged and ultimately in the end that's what happens. Um, so you'll see that the, the highest quality articles on Wikipedia have this overly cited look to them. This is not how you would write an academic article. This is not how you would write a news article. But Wikipedia has its own style, and this is definitely the Wikipedia style, overly cited. <laughs> um, um, and another reason to do that is because if you're adding in a lot of material in that, um, yes, the English Wikipedia style, uh, if you're adding in a lot of material sort of piecemeal, like I was doing sentence by sentence, and then somebody is rearranging those sentences later, if you attach a reference to that sentence, um, it doesn't get lost. But if I add in a whole paragraph um, with one little reference at the end and then someone pulls out a sentence from that paragraph and moves it later, the fact that it was referenced to a particular thing will be lost. So actually adding a reference after every sentence is not a bad idea because of that very thing, because you're remixing all this stuff as you go. That's a very good point. Well, I think we've come to the end of the hour. Uh, this has really been a fascinating session, though. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective on all of this with us, Adrienne. Um, do you have? Uh, do you want to share maybe your Wikipedia user page or some way to get in touch with you if people have follow-up questions? Yeah, sure. I'll put that up. Just a second. Okay. And so I hope everyone will be able to join us on Thursday in our lab session uh, where we can dig into your projects a little more in a little more depth. Uh, it would be, for example, I think this, uh, this project around a list of OER repositories would really be something we could do a lot more justice to in the lab session. Um, we could you know, take 15 or 20 minutes and really look at some of the sources and, and talk about how to develop an article like that. So hope to see you on Thursday and then again next week when we will have uh, additional guests who, uh, with a little bit more of a focus on OER. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. See you soon.